Hello, welcome to the Dear Nikki podcast, where I'm going to be giving you personalized user research advice based on your questions or struggles. So let's dive into today's episode. Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode. (laughs) Gotta have fun. Gotta have fun. I hope you're doing well. It's mid-December, which is unbelievable. Honestly, the time just flies. It really does. Soon we will be on holiday if you're celebrating. If you're not celebrating, hopefully you're going on holiday anyways because a lot of other people might be going on holiday. So maybe you get an extra holiday. (laughs) And yeah, I am, we're headed back to the United States to visit my parents, which is exciting. It's not my favorite time to travel, admittedly, but it's fine. It's nice to see, it's nice to see family and, you know, have an adventure. Why, why not? At least we're not bringing the animals. That is what I can say. (laughs) I will be trying desperately to just get some sleep. The last time that I went to the U.S. when I was uh, going for the People Nerds Conference in Chicago, I worked the entire way there. And it's there is something nice, I will say. There's something nice about working on a plane because you're stuck. You're just, there's nothing else for you to do. <laughs> you're just like hanging out. I guess you could watch movies and I guess you could read. But I was I was working and I was also writing. And, you know, there there is a, there is a forcing function in that sense on in in terms of being on a plane where you're just kind of kind of stuck with it you can't really do too much else so anyways yeah we're we're excited to to head back for for the holidays hopefully some festivities uh and then and then starting starting the new year which i'm very excited about i must admit i am very excited i'm doing some cool new things so keep an eye out i'm going to have some group programs which i haven't done for a while but i am i'm going to start doing some more group programs so that i can help more people i have my my black friday deal that that went out that mini mind uh it's a four a four week program group program starting the 27th of february february yeah that that week we have a 28th of february this year or I guess next year, uh, the 20, 2023 is a 28th of February. So happy birthday to anybody who was, uh, who only gets to celebrate their birthday, what, every four years or so. Um, so that is, that's going to be starting and I'm going to be doing more, more group sessions. So keep an eye out for those. If that's something that you're interested in, I'm going to try and theme them as well. I have some cool themes like generative research, mastermind and insights mastermind so that they're, they're a little bit more themed and, and we can really focus in on particular skills and get, get a lot done during that time. But anyways, I'm just babbling on, which I could just could honestly do, except I have a 30 minute max <laughs> within this app, which is really interesting. So I have a wonderful question that came in that is, what are your thoughts on concept testing? What is it actually? When do you use it? How do you use it? All of those kinds of questions. Now, I I have a lot of thoughts on concept testing. And the reason that I have a lot of thoughts on concept testing is because to me, it's a very very blurry method because when you look online honestly do a google search even a google scholar search right look around there's not actually that much when it comes to pure what i call pure concept testing concept testing oftentimes to to what i understand and all the research that i've done on it gets lumped in with usability testing or with other types of tests So I think that this is a very important question because I don't think a lot of people are doing pure concept testing. And I would love to share my my thoughts, my opinions, my definitions, how I've done it in the past, and also how it differs from some of the things that I've seen people call concept testing that to me are different methodologies. Now, this is of course something that you can take or leave. You know, User research has a variety of definitions for for many different things, right? Or many, many, many of the same things. You know, we we can call call 
one one concept many different things but i just wanted to share my experience with my definition of of concept testing and how that differs from other approaches and yeah honestly totally fine to take it or leave it totally fine to disagree if you disagree i'd love to hear more if you agree also love to hear more about that and how you're how you're doing concept testing so always feel free to reach out to me and and talk to me about it you can also join my membership and we can have a session a q a session just on concept testing you know what that's a really great idea see i come up with good ideas when i talk out loud and ramble so let's dive in to concept testing so for me concept testing is when you put early stage ideas in front of participants to determine which direction the team should go in or whether or not your team is going in the right direction. And these tests really help you understand how people are feeling about your concepts or ideas. So for me, concept testing doesn't necessarily give you a yes or no answer of this is right, this is wrong. It doesn't give you any sort of preference of this concept versus this concept. Essentially, when I do concept testing, what I try to understand is what do people think of the different concepts? What are their reactions? What are their 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 thoughts, their feelings surrounding the concepts? And how did those concepts align or not align with people's mental models? So oftentimes I will put two or three concepts in front of people. So I will test two or three concepts and understand how each one individually aligns or doesn't align with that person's mental models, uh, the things that are confusing about it, the thoughts that people have about it, the feelings, the reactions that people have. And then at the end, what I like to do is that kind of Frankenstein question or Frankenstein conversation where we start taking the different concepts and mashing them into one concept that makes the most sense for somebody. So my concept tests oftentimes have some sort of co-creation. I call it, yeah, I call it the Frankenstein conversation, but have some kind of co-creation at the end where I'm bringing together the concepts because I don't believe that a concept test is meant to determine like one concept over the other, right? Oftentimes the ideas aren't aren't fully formed to a, a point where somebody could, a user could make a decision between the two of them. And also we're putting, generally speaking, I mean, I know that there's some dynamic stimuli that goes out, but we're putting primarily like static stimuli in front of somebody. They're not really using it most of the time. Like it's not personalized to them. It's not customized to them. They're more early stage ideas. So asking somebody to make a decision about which concept is better when it's a concept is super hard for participants. You know, like imagine asking that for yourself. Uh, this is something that I always tell researchers to do. When you're asking participants questions, imagine if somebody was asking them to you, could you actually give somebody, give another researcher an answer to this question? So I'm getting a little bit off topic now. So I'm going to pull it back in. That's like a separate conversation, a separate podcast episode on asking yourself your questions before you ask participants. <laughs> so that to me is what a concept test is, right? So helping your team understand how people feel about these concepts, if they align or don't align with mental models, if they are confusing, all of those things, so that your team can go back and further refine the concepts. So to to me, my outcome from a concept test is this understanding of what people think of these concepts and then that co-creation Frankenstein of what if we put these things together Right. So there will sometimes be a few rounds of concept testing as we refine the idea more and more. And then once we essentially pick an idea or two, we would that we want to take to the next step, then we would move into usability testing. And what I will say too is oftentimes I see teams relying too much on participants picking the right answer for them. Right. So I'll see teams trying to determine, okay, which concept is it that we should go forward with? Your participants can't really make that, I make that call for you. Uh, There, there are times where user research is not helpful in that space and, and an internal decision needs to be made to move forward. Right. So what you're doing is you're gathering 
information about the concept so that your team can make an informed decision about what the next step is. Not so your participants can make a decision about what your next step is. So again, let's say you have three or four concepts that you're putting in front of people and you do one, one round and you kind of knock out one concept because people were just saying, this doesn't make sense. It's really confusing. It doesn't help me with my needs. It doesn't help me with my goals. In fact, it brings up more problems. So let's say you knock out a concept and the three other ones, you kind of refine because you did that Frankenstein co-creation and you kind of refine into, into maybe three concepts. Okay. So three more concepts. So you refine them more. You go into the next round of concept testing and let's say you get even more information on these three and you understand that there are two that come that come out one frankenstein one and one that's still standing on its own concept concept a let's say and then a frankenstein concept from those three and then what you do is you say okay we have these two concepts and we're not going to ask our users to decide on one because they're concepts and users can't decide on one let's turn them into something that's usable and do some usability testing on them right so put them in people's hands and see if people can use them. So that's how concept testing kind of evolves into usability testing. So let me take a step back because I, I can get very fiery about this. So we have this definition of concept testing that I, that I just kind of went through. So when exactly do you use concept testing? I think about concept testing in two different phases. The first one's the discovery phase. So essentially, Imagine you're working at a company that provides retirement plans. So dur during generative research, you found that younger people who should be thinking about a retirement plan don't understand the value or how it works. It's very hard as an individual who is younger to think about things that won't affect them for potentially 50, 60 years, right? So during an ideation session, let's say you, you find this from research, during an ideation session, your, your team comes up with several concepts or ideas to help younger people understand how important it is to start saving for retirement, right? And, and maybe how to get started. So your team comes up with these three ideas and concepts. They're not really sure, you know, which, which way to go because there's three pretty different concepts. Then that's a perfect time to use concept testing in the discovery phase. Like, so you have this, this very general idea, right? And you're trying to understand, you know, is there, are, which, which of these ideas, which of these concepts resonate with people, you know, or, or can they take these three concepts and, and co-create with you and create a Frankenstein of a concept that is super helpful for them? Right? So that's one time when you can more in that discovery phase when you can use concept testing. So the next phase that I would use it in is quite honestly next in the in the product development phase and or product development process, sorry. And that's kind of that ideation phase. So you're you're choosing some of these concepts so let's go with that with that other one let's say that you had three or four concepts that you put in front of these younger people about retirement and trying to show them the value of it and so now you have two right you you have you have two ideas and you go and you can continue to ideate on them and do another concept test right so so that maybe they're slightly more higher fidelity because they're they're more built out and you're asking people you know what do you feel about this one how does this feel what's confusing and what what makes sense what doesn't make sense what what needs do you have when it comes to this area right so again you're 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 still in that concept test phase and at the end of that maybe you have that co-creation where you create one idea or maybe you still are left with two ideas and you move towards usability testing at that point, right? So that's the, so those are the two phases, the discovery phase and that more like ideation phase of when I would use concept testing. And they play very nicely with each other. Like as you see, like I just flowed from those three or four concepts within a discovery phase to two concepts in the ideation phase. And then that com comes out with either two uh, prototypes to test for usability or one prototype to test for usability. 
if you are testing two different prototypes for like within the usability space, so you're, you're moving on from concept testing to usability testing, what I would highly recommend doing is comparative usability testing. So really comparing the usability of, of each of those prototypes. And I'll pop a, a link in the show notes about comparative usability testing, because that's a very important thing to do so that we don't slip into preference testing. So those are the two, the two phases when I generally will use concept testing. And what I will say is what, what I, what I, let me, let me go. Okay. I will go through some questions that I ask during con concept testing, and then I'm going to get a little bit into the whole concept testing versus other methodologies where I see some confusion generally. So when it comes to concept testing, I, you can use qualitative and quantitative metrics um, to, to kind of, or qualitative and quantitative question types to ask users about how they're feeling about the, the concepts. But a lot of my concept tests tend to be moderated and they tend to be heavier on the qualitative side. So I will ask questions. So I will show them the, the, the stimuli, whether that is static or dynamic stim. And just keep in mind, if you have multiple stim, like, so if you have three different concepts that you're showing to participants, make sure you're varying the order that you show the concepts for each participant. So participant one gets concept A, concept B, concept C. Participant two gets concept B, concept C, concept A. Participant three gets concept C, concept A, concept B, so, right? So just make sure you're varying those uh, when, while you're testing with participants. So my, my concept tests tend to be very, uh, qualitative because I have that co-creation session afterwards. So I will show, uh, one of the concepts to one at a time to participants. And I will ask questions like, walk me through your overall impression. Have you see, seen something similar? What do you think of this? Have you used something similar to this? Why or why not? How is that experience? What's confusing? What's missing? What is your overall reaction to this? How are you feeling about this? So asking those types of qualitative questions. You can also ask people, how would you describe this to someone else? so that you can get a, an understanding of what they're seeing from their own words. So questions like that on the qualitative side. When it comes to quantitative questions, such as satisfaction scores, surveys, or scale-based scale, scale -based questions, you can ask things similar to on a scale of one to seven, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with this concept? Or on a scale of one to seven, you know, how, how much does this concept help you achieve your goals? One, not at all. Seven helps me achieve all my goals, things like that. So you can try and add in some, some quantitative scales, let's say. But again, my, my concept tests tend to be really qualitative. So again, I will show those each stim individually and ask those qualitative questions and maybe pop in a scale at the end of each one. And then I go into that co-creation. So I put all three concepts up or in front of the person, depending on if we're in person or remote, you can do, honestly, you can do this for either remote or in person. It's totally doable. And then I say, let's pull apart the things that make the most sense, the things that help you the most, the things that help you achieve your goals, help solve some pain points that you have, and let's create our concept together. That would be most helpful for you. And within that space, so they kind of take the different elements from from different concepts and put them into this Frankenstein. That's again why I call it the Frankenstein Frankenstein conversation. So that is how I tend to go about concept testing. That's to me the purest form of concept testing. And at the end, again, the outcome for me is not to tell my team this one, this concept or that concept. It's to say, you know, you know, a concept B and concept C resonated the most with people and how they, how they could help people with their pain points, how they could help people achieve their goals, right? Or 
none of the concepts on their own were really great, but we created some Frankenstein concepts. And here are the common themes behind the Frankenstein concepts. Okay? Or concept A, nobody had found any value with. It was not helpful. It was confusing. It didn't make any sense, right? So those are the outcomes that I am I am looking for. So it's to give direction to the team so the team can make better decisions. Again, not so your participants can make decisions for you. So I just want to talk through really quickly now, for me, the difference between concept testing versus things like usability testing, content testing, visual testing, and A-B testing, and the horrendous preference testing. So concept testing, again, is putting these early stage concepts and they can they can they can be low fidelity concepts they could be drawings i've done drawings right or they could be higher fidelity concepts i i had i tested some static stim that was really high fidelity drawings and of of a journey that somebody would go through when they were doing something in particular right so they were high fidelity concepts but for me usability testing is really testing that effectiveness efficiency and satisfaction around how people are using an actual product. So concept testing, people aren't clicking around as much. They're not doing things. You're not really saying, did you succeed in that task? You're not really asking them to do tasks. You're asking them about the concept. So that's the big difference between, for me, concept testing and usability. And then we have content testing. And I actually see a lot of people doing content testing and calling it concept testing. I know those are a little bit close together. But for me, content testing exposes whether or not users can adequately find and understand critical information within your product, service, whatever it might be, right? So it's it's seeing if people can process your copy, if people can come to your website or app and understand the value of your product or understand what you're selling or understand what, what messaging you have? Can they actually understand the words that you're putting out there? So content testing for me is much more about messaging and copy and looking at the actual content rather than concepts. So more overarching concepts. And then I also see a lot of people doing visual testing as concept testing. So for me, visual testing is about people's perceptions of a design or a brand right? So it looks, and maybe this is why these two get mixed up because visual testing looks at people's reactions to what we put in front of them, which is very similar to concept testing, but visual testing is more along the lines of like brand attributes. So looking at attributes that brands might have. So when you put a, a brand or an image in front of people, you know, does this does this make them feel happy, sad, motivated, powerful, empowered, depressed, unmotivated, right? So it's it's visual testing for me is that more of that snap judgment of looking at different attributes and how the visualization of whatever you're putting in front of them makes them feel, right? And I know that I said concept testing is asking people how they feel, but it's asking people how they feel about concepts, not about visualizations. It's more about like putting this concept in front of somebody and really understanding if it makes sense or not and their general re reactions to what you put in front of them rather than looking into things like a design or a brand. So I see this I see this mix up happening a lot, at least to me it's a mix up. Uh, so visual testing is like five second tests are, are a really great example of visual testing, brand attribute, open open word choice, closed word choice. Those are all really great examples of visual testing in my mind. So really looking at that resonance of certain brand attributes or certain feelings that are associated when people see a brand or a design. And then also I see A-B testing being used as content testing. So A-B testing is you take two versions of one asset, so one concept, let's say, or, or no, I'm not going to say one concept. You take two versions of something, like a page, and you put them against each other. However, it is very, very small changes. So let's take a checkout page. You put one version of a checkout page and another version of a checkout page. And in that, 
there is a red checkout button or a blue checkout button. I'm getting really basic here, but I'm just trying to make a point. Then you test which one performs better, the red or the blue. I can tell you probably the blue would perform better because red means cancel. <laughs> but, you know, so it's it's very small incremental changes. So for instance, um, Etsy, Etsy actually did this. I, I noticed them doing an AV test because my, my husband and I were both checking out on Etsy and this was a while ago. And I think they actually um, changed the, the copy. My, my checkout button said, send to Jersey or whatever. And his checkout button just said, purchase now. Right. So uh, they were testing kind of that checkout button of just purchase now and that that further confirmation of you're sending this to your particular destination. Double check because I, I would imagine maybe they got a lot of people who had a default address in and then they were going to send it somewhere else and blah, blah, blah. So there were returns. So that that's in my mind what they were testing. So I saw like that's an incremental change. That's an A-B test right? Concept testing is not A-B testing. And A-B testing generally needs a large amount of traffic, depending on how many, uh, your audience and how many users you're getting to your website or app or whatever. But A-B testing requires a very large percentage of your audience to see it so that you can pro properly compare these incremental changes. So concept testing is generally around like 15 to 25 people per segment. Right? So you can't do an A-B test with concept testing because you're showing too many different changes between concepts, right? They're, the, the concepts are too different. It's not apples to apples. It's apples to oranges, right? You can't really compare them in that way of, of being able to choose like A or B concept. So I see that happen in a lot. So just be careful around, around that. And then finally, there's preference testing. And I hate preference. I hate the word preference. I think it's just like preference is... is just impossible to figure out. There are just so many confounding variables about preference. It's often future-based. There's just nothing great about preference, right? People, people just like we can't, we can't make that decision. And when you ask people what their preference is, you're essentially asking users to make the decision for you on what is what they prefer so that you don't have to make that decision, right? So this is looking into concept tests of like, which one did people like more? First, like, who knows what that means? What what do people prefer? Who knows what that means? Preference can mean so many different things. There are so many confounding variables going into that, right? So whenever people talk about preference testing, I always say, you know, go back to usability testing or go back to just understanding, you know, how concepts resonate with people or don't resonate with people, how they align with mental models or don't, how they help solve needs, goals, and pain points, because that is what we're actually trying to get to. We're not trying to just build something that people prefer because we're building that without any knowledge. If we base things off of pain points and goals and needs and how people are are, are responding to that in that sense and and things that align with people men, people's mental models, then we are building the right things, right? So try and stay away from preference testing as much as you can. So I think I'm ready to get off my soapbox for concept testing. It's a long, long episode. I hope that that was helpful in kind of clarifying concept testing and the, the way that the way that I define it and that pure concept testing and how I go about using it and the types of questions that I ask and when I use it and also the differences between those other methodologies that I think are fantastic, but we really should not be overlapping with concept testing because when, whenever we take very different methodologies that actually have different goals and call them the same thing, we are confusing a lot of different things and also people, right? So just be very mindful about about that if you if you're able to. And I would love to hear anybody's feedback on this. Uh, if you disagree with me, if you agree with me, either way, I'd love to hear. And yeah, I hope that that was helpful. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. And I will talk to you soon. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to hit subscribe and submit your next question. And I look forward to talking to you all soon. Bye. Thank you.